September 10th, 2020, um, and uh, this is the third um, community uh, commission, the police commission policy committee meeting here. I want to thank everyone uh, for being here, um, and I'll just quickly go through our our list of uh, committee members to just confirm who's here. Um, I believe as well we do have quorum, but Mr. Allen? Here. Good evening, Ms. Allen. Ms. Bilal? Ms. Bilal? Not quite with us yet. Okay, not a problem. Mr. Delgado? Present. All right, good evening, Ms. Delgado. Ms. Uh, Freeman, I, mean, I know Ms. Freeman won't um, be able to make it tonight. Uh, Dr. Jackson? Dr. Jackson? Mr. Johnson? Hi, Ashley. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Jackson just asked me for the link, so I was just sending it to him. So he should be getting on here shortly. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lucas. Uh, do we have Mr. Johnson yet? No? I, I hear Vice Chair Lucas. Good evening. Um, Mr. Matthews? Here. Good evening, Mr. Matthews. Good, Good Mr. evening. Thank you. Mr. Oliver. Uh, present. Good evening, Mr. Oliver. Mr. Pulley. Mr. Pulley. Sorry, can you let me button off? I'm here. Not a problem. Not a problem. Good evening, Mr. Pulley. Mr. Uh, well, here we go. Uh, yep, we have Mr. Sherell. Sherell, where is this no. Robinson? I'm here. Yep, I thought I saw you there, Mr. Robinson. Evening, and last but not least, Mr. Woods. Mr. Woods? Yep, I think you're still muted, Mr. Woods, but I do see you in the panelist system. Let me see if I can back up and find you. There you go. We can hear you now. Good evening. Good, good evening, Mr. Woods. Starting uh, talking to Ms. Sorry. Bilal, have you joined us? I'm sorry, Ms. Crawford, was that you? Yeah, I was just asking if you wanted me to go ahead and give a call to those members that aren't here yet. Yeah, let me, uh, I think that would be great. Let me just confirm, Ms. Bilal, are you here? No, um, and then uh, Dr. Jackson, has he been able to join us yet? I think Dr. Jackson is joining now. He had an uh, issue with the link. Um, and then other than that, I think it's just uh, Mr. Um, I'm, oh, Mr. Johnson. Has Mr. Johnson joined us? No. Nope. Mr. Cheryl. Yeah. So if we could contact those three or four people, that would be great. Dr. Jackson may be on soon. Thank you, Ms. Crawford. Thank you. Um, well, thanks everyone for joining. We'll, we'll jump right in and um, move along here. Um, I do uh, just want to offer a few updates. I want to thank everyone, also those of you that have communicated throughout the week, updates on your own research and uh, questions you may have had uh, as well. And we're going to uh, pause before we move to item three on the agenda to give space and time for Mr. Robinson to uh, share an update of um, a space where he's been working diligently to extend an opportunity, to create an opportunity for the committee. Um, but I also just want to acknowledge in the agenda in front of us, we have tonight testimony um, from subject matter expert, uh, Dr. Peter Valer, um, who will be joined in the Q&A section of his presentation by Ms. Uh, Liz Orozco. All, uh, both of them are from the Metropolitan National Community Oversight uh, staff. Um, you can see more about them on the on the agenda. But before we get there, we will pause uh, intentionally to have a conversation um, led by Ms. Cirillo, focused on the commission process for data and some of the updates related to the data committee. Uh, and there is a decision that needs to be made here by the committee as to who will represent us um, in that particular newly formed committee, subcommittee, and then uh, also a racial disparities uh, and use of force tactics discussion that Mr. Woods will lead us in, and I'd love to hear others' uh, voice and opinion on that as well. Um, Ms. Lucas, Vice Chair Lucas, anything you would share or add to that? Sorry, no, sounds good. Sounds great, not a problem. Uh, it's hard to find that mute button, so if you just want to thumbs up, that works too, I get it. 
Um, and also just want to share if anyone, if there's any space in the time of tonight in the committee, I know we're still getting the rhythm of things, but feel free to use the, the hand function or to unmute yourself. I'm, I'm sliding through the, uh, the list of particip participants to make sure I don't miss anyone. Um, but if you have uh, been waiting to, to speak or have something you want to share, please feel free to do so. This is our hour of meeting, uh, not anyone's individually. So it's important that we all feel engaged here. With that, I extend the floor to Mr. Robinson uh, to discuss the training account. Mr. Robinson. Thank you, Ms. Davis. I appreciate the, the opportunity here. Um, Last week when we met, we were divided into certain subcommittees and the committee I was uh, placed on was the, um, or asked to be a part of was the excessive force committee. Um, after the presentation by the uh, training academy supervisors last week, I um, called and asked to speak. Uh, I ended up with, with Lieutenant uh, Dupuy. Um, and we had several people, including myself, ask about the opportunity to participate in perhaps the, um, the shoot, don't shoot simulator that they have at the department. I also, um, heard the supervisors talk last week about excessive force and the use of force continuum and they were explaining it. I happen to be more of a visual person myself. So when I contacted the training academy, I also asked about the possibility of having a demonstration of how they teach the use of force continuum, how they go through that. Uh, and have the opportunity for us to visualize this and watch them walk through everything. And so um, Lieutenant Dupuy emailed me back. He said that uh, they would be pleased to have our group out to the training academy. He gave me either of the next two Thursdays uh, he, they have a gymnasium there and they have been doing their training classes uh, with 70 cadets, he said, spaced out for social distancing in the gymnasium. And so that's where we would, um, I guess they would do their demonstration and presentation and give us the opportunity to ask questions as well as um, we didn't, uh, they said they could socially distance, distance each of us also with the simulator. So I, I told Ms. Davis, I felt like this was, we had had some interest from our group uh, about this. Uh, some of you all have probably done a simulator before with your law enforcement backgrounds. Um, I, I have never done that. Um, but I would, I'm very interested to see how it works. Uh, so I have asked Ms. Davis if we could poll the group to see if we could, I've loosely referred to it as a field trip, but uh, to see if either the 17th or the 24th, if we as a group would be interested in going to the training academy see the demonstration and to also go through the simulator. Um, I think we're gonna be asked to make recommendations, uh, I guess, first of all, evaluate and then make recommendations about the use of force policy. I think the use of force recommendations from the Department of Justice that we're going to hear uh, speakers talk about tonight would be uh, very interesting to hear and then to go into our training academy and see what is currently in use or what we might look at changing. Uh, with that said, Ms. Davis, I'll yield the floor back to you or anyone else to dis discuss whether this is something we want to do collectively. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Just a quick question, and I'll go to the committee. Did they share, um, the, you know, start time, duration of uh, the visit, just so that folks can consider their calendars? Yes, they, they said they could work uh, time-wise. They could work uh, begin and end. I told them our meetings are generally two hours. They said we could do that. Um, and 
if we wanted to start a little earlier than six or at six or just a little later than six, that they would accommodate that. Great. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Uh, any questions, thoughts uh, here from the committee? This is certainly a worthwhile experience. Um, and it, my understanding here that the only kind of wrinkle I think of is that we would um, we would certainly need to think about how do we how do we add to or make up for the the missed opportunity for additional testimony that we might have had in mind for next week. But we all have many of us had in, interest and energy around um, seeing the training academy in person and asking questions as well. Um, you know, we agree that silence equals consensus here, but I do uh, I would like to know if there's any date that works better for others than the, you know, than one. So are we comfortable with moving forward and perhaps having this visit next Thursday um, at our regular 6 p.m. start time? And perhaps we will get logistics um, ahead of time. Does that work for uh, work for everyone or not work for anyone? It's helpful to know. Maybe better stated, is anyone not comfortable with that? Ashley, if I may, are you asking us if the 17th or the 24th works better for our schedule? Yes, the 17th. Yeah, okay. is it we prepared for next Thursday? That's my question. Gotcha. I could do it on the 17th. The 24th would be difficult for me. Every other week, my um, last session bumps up against the meeting, so it'd be hard for me to get over there. My presence is not entirely necessary, as I've done all these simulators before, so please don't. Uh, make a decision based on that, but I just want to throw out, I can make the 17th work, 24th would be a little tough. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Crawford, I see your hand there. That was an, that was an accident, sorry. Okay, no problem, no problem. Uh, so, uh, so uh, hearing uh, nothing uh, opposing the 17th, and feel free to unmute if, it's, if I'm uh, missing anyone here. I think we should move forward, Mr. Robinson, and, and ask them for their availability or to confirm us for next Thursday. And um, it, it would probably make a lot of sense if we could, I'm, I'm sure they'd like us to arrive a few minutes beforehand, but if we could just touch base perhaps in, um, I'd love to, and I welcome the committee as well to share if there's specific topics or um, other points of interest that we wanna make sure they are highlight or touch on, touch on. Uh, but I believe your subcommittee, Mr. Robinson, is kind of leading the way on that. So that's great. Okay. Sounds great. Some more information come. Oh, you unmute, Mr. Robinson. I will work on setting that up and getting a getting the address and. Uh, so that everyone knows where to be and at what time. And I'll take any suggestions for any other topics uh, and gladly ask uh, them to add those to our meeting. Okay, thank you, Mr. Robinson, appreciate it. It's great. And we'll follow up too, that kind of leads me to my next uh, topic here. We've received information and uh, related to today's conversation and, and thank, I'm thanking Dr. Valier uh, ahead of time here for the helpful um, resource he set shared with us so that we could uh, be prepared for his com conversation and testimony with us today. What we are working on, I've chatted with uh, Vice Chair Lucas about this, is ensuring that we have a very clear calendar and understanding of the testimony to be expected over the next uh, three weeks uh, so that everyone can begin to prepare what questions, topics, uh, approach the, the committee has in mind. Uh, my hope also, my, my plan at least here, is that we would also be able to offer at least a very, very, very clean uh, draft of the agenda by Tuesday, uh, the Tuesday before every meeting. And so that plan would be that, you know, instead of receiving it 24 hours or even 36 hours, folks would have a full 48 hours to review the agenda ahead of the, the, the time of the meeting, but you would also have the information related to the experts expected to speak that week as well. Um, does that Tuesday deadline or, or that we're kind of putting on ourselves, does that work for everyone? Or um, is there a request um, for something earlier than that? Because I, I and know personally, I, I want things early, as early as I can get them, but certainly we're waiting on people to clear their schedules for us too. Right here, no dissent there. And we'll move forward with that approach and respect that agenda. Oh yes, please, right ahead, go right ahead. 
has picked up on this issue? Yes, please. You know, to the degree that Metro or Metro Police Bar is hand feeding us data each week, they're paralyzing our efforts. I mean, let's, let's be blunt about this. When we get an agenda with topics the day before or two days before, uh, on my schedule, that means maybe I'll get 30 minutes in that two days to look at it and think about it. And I know other people on the committee are as busy or busier than I am. There's no excuse for the police department not disgorging the data we've been asking for for three weeks now. It's just their way to hide and frustrate the purpose of this committee. Larry, I think that's unfair. I have to speak up here. We're trying to get this organized as quickly as possible. The police department has been nothing but responsive to our requests. Requests are coming from every committee. They need to be rooted and managed in a, in a way that they can respond. But you need to know that the police department has been responding quickly to information requests. And I just don't agree that they've been trying, that they have, have been trying to block things up. Just, I'm sure that's what they're telling you. Don't doubt your word at all. But the reality is three weeks ago, I asked for the clearance rate data on the Nashville Police Department. That's data under federal law that they have to report every year, every quarter. In fact, the FBI, it ought to take about three minutes to assemble that data. And we hadn't gotten it yet. So and, what need, and what needs to happen, Larry, is that you need to talk to your committee chair and the committee chairs need to prioritize these data requests. My impression from talking about clearance rates was that that was not central to this committee. If it is central to this committee, we can absolutely get you clearance rates, but it needs to flow through the committee chairs. And we are setting up this working group precisely so that we can get information quickly. And by bringing together MNTD and MNC, MNCO people, the same thing, we'll also wanna make sure we have the same facts for everyone. Mm. So, so let me um, let me just ask here, uh, Mr. Bunn, because I want to be clear about the process. This is um, first time I'm hearing about this, but I want to be clear so that we can be responsive to what Mr. Woods is pointing out, and maybe others have request out as well. Is there a list, or um, because I, I doubt I'm on every email where people are make committee members are making requests, but is there a list so that I can know at least from our committee what data requests are still outstanding, so that we can prioritize that? So we need, I would say, from my viewpoint, and Dia, I want to defer to you on what you think about the process is. We need to make sure that we receive from committee chairs and co-chairs a list of data that they, that they need in advance. And I also think that we are moving to a system where committee chairs and co-chairs send out the agenda. It's our job just to support you as part of that effort. Um, but I just do want to strongly convey that MNPD has been responsive to the data requests that, that we have been asking. And I don't think that there's an attempt to frustrate anyone on, on you know, access to things like clearance rates. So actually what I would ask for you is if you're going into a meeting and you feel like you have not received meeting information that you need in advance for a meeting, you know, reach out to the DA era and we will get you that information. And of course, our hope is that by having the data working group begin meeting next week, that mm -hmm. we'll have a way to prioritize the requests and have every committee understand what data everyone else is asking for. Yeah, Ms. Sorello, would you add anything? To that? I just I have a few other follow-up questions. But I didn't want to cut you off. I thought you might be unmuting there. You know, and I'm happy to hold my remarks until my time on the agenda. So you just call me when you're ready. But that my my remarks do speak to this. So just whenever okay. you're ready. Right. Okay. Thank you. I just want a few things here, and then we can move forward. I just um maybe I'm, and uh, John, thanks for your response here. I just want to be clear. And maybe, Ms. Arello, you give me a thumbs up here or unmute and tell me if you're about to touch on this. But will there be, so for instance, Mr. Wood's request, right? Or perhaps, you know, let's say Ms. Lucas, and I'm just using her by share as an example. If she sends an email directly to Mr. Biden or to yourself or other members of the mayor's staff and, and makes a request, but the chair's not on that email, would I automatically as chair be made aware of that so we can prioritize that and communicate the decision back to the committee member so that they're not waiting on something that has somehow been decided needs to be shared with another committee? Um, I just want to be clear on that. 
Yeah. So I think that would be great. From my viewpoint, it would be helpful if requests went to you, Ashley, and that way we can we can you know know what your priorities are for the committee and make sure that we answer those requests. Okay, but for outstanding requests, what what will be our process for that? For something like what Mr. Woods is is speaking of. Well, so my suggestion is that would be that you and the vice chair communicate to us what you consider the outstanding request. Okay. Okay. So let, thank you. Let me go to the, the floor here. Um, and Ms. Lucas, if you could take notes with me, that'd be great. Mr. Woods, um, let's just begin with you so I'm clear and other members of the committee, if you could be prepared to unmute and share with me, is there any data request um, that you've made that is still outstanding just so that I, we can be aware here? Mr. Woods, would you begin for us? Let, let me be clear. Each of the three major data requests I've made, I've prefaced by saying I'd like to ask the Metro staff to get for us, but if they want writing, I'll be glad to send to you, uh, Ms. Chair, in writing, and you can then decide what priority to give it. I've not gotten any data on any request I've made. And the requests are the clearance rate, which is federally required data that they must maintain. They don't have to compile it. They don't have to search for it. It's right there. Second request was for the number of complaints, which I'm going to talk about at some length tonight, I guess. Third request was on the use of force, the missing 260 cases that I'll talk about tonight. Uh, now that request is only last week, but the real problem there is it comes out of their own publication, the December 2019 Police Department publication, and no one from the police department seems to know who authored the publication. Therefore, it's hard to figure out who to ask out of these numbers get misnumbered, incomplete, and misleading. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Woods. Any other members of the committee, any uh, data requests that you've, uh, that you've made that perhaps are outstanding or are outstanding? Okay. So um, we have a meeting tomorrow morning um, please, by the way, Ms. Lucas, let me know if I become choppy here, um, but uh, in my audio, we have a, mo a meeting tomorrow morning uh, just for the committee to know. In fact, we have a standing meeting 930 in the morning on Friday to follow up to this meeting so that anything that comes out of the, our committee meeting that needs immediate attention that we need to confirm so that we're prepared for the agenda is acted upon. We'll put this at the top of the list um, and then Mr. Woods and also to the whole body here, uh, we'll get back to the entire space here to give you an update before end of business tomorrow. So we're all on the same page um, and the data or request here, I can't imagine that there's any data request that one member makes that won't benefit or be of good use to the entire body of the committee here. So we'll ensure that it's shared uh, with the entire committee as well. Uh, but Mr. Woods, thank you for reminding us here, but also if, if everyone could just um, now utilize the, the process we just um, learned about here and please include myself and Vice Chair Lucas on your email um, with any uh, subsequent data requests, but we will follow up and give us an answer on this uh, as well. Thank you, Mr. Woods, for your diligence here. Anything else to this matter here? Um, Mr. Pulley, Mr. Pulley. Thank you, Madam Chair, for leading us through that process discussion. I think it's pretty clear now. I appreciate uh, you walking us through that. Uh, just to be, uh, just to clarify, you said you're meeting on uh, 930 on Friday, and I heard the we, but I didn't know who all that was. So if you just tell us who's in that meeting. Sure, absolutely. It's myself, uh, Vice Chair Lucas, uh, Mr. Button, and Ms. Cirillo. Um, and at, at times when Mr. Brown can make the meeting, um, he joins us as well. Um, but that, that, that's, uh, that's who composes that meeting. Thank you very much. I appreciate that clarification. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any additional questions or uh, points here on this matter? Okay, uh, just a quick update too that, and I believe it was Ms. Bilal who uh, writes this towards the end of the last meeting. Uh, but we, Ms. Cirillo has been working uh, very hard and diligent to, diligently with others to ensure that we have a SharePoint site so that we can upload all of the information, the data um, and other resources that we receive and, and have it in one place. And I believe Mr. Rollo says that they've made good traction there and hope to have something activated for us in the next week uh, or shorter. But as soon as we have that, uh, we'll share uh, that out with everyone. Uh, and we'll have a bit of a resource library for everyone to use. And we'll also make sure that everyone knows how to use it 
as well, more importantly. So we'll come back on that. And then last but not least, I believe um, here, I had a data committee. Yes, last year, and Mr. Rillo is about to speak to us about um, the data, um, a topic and data committee. But just for the committee to know tonight, before we end the meeting, we do need to have at least one, um, need to have uh, nominations or um, or designee for, to represent this committee on the data committee that has been formed. Uh, we will learn more about this uh, in just a moment, but I just want to plant that seed that as you hear more about what's happening and what's to come, um, that we certainly need someone that is willing to step up and uh, take this lead. So with that, Ms. Cirillo. Good evening, Madam Chair uh, Davis and Madam Vice Chair Lucas and members of the committee. Thank you so much for this opportunity to present to you tonight. My remarks are going to be focused on the creation of the data committee. Um, we, uh, at the end of last week, we realized given all of the interconnected issues that the committees are looking at um, and um, the, uh, some similar data requests, it made a lot of sense to create a data committee. Um, this uh, committee does not in any way supplant the work of your committee. It merely supplements it. Um, the uh, designee from each of the committees um, serves as a representative, will be taking information and decisions back to your committee to inform you, as well as Vice, Vice Chair Lucas and the members of the committee. Um, every new piece of data that we request from MNPD will go out to all the commission members um, and be available for the data committee. Um, so um, everybody will continue to have full access to data. Um, the data committee's approach is going to be looking at how much are we doing, how well are we doing it, and who is better off. It is specifically going to be looking at administrative data in this context. Um, this process does not supplant your process on generating recommendations. Many of your members are interested in the 21st Century Task Force, they're interested in the Eight Can't Wait, and they're interested in other national standards and practices. All those are good recommendations. What the data committee is looking to do is actually very specifically to define what are the problems that we're seeing in data um, and that, uh, that then can be matched with your recommendations. It will, uh, the product of this committee will help the other committees and your committee to um, prioritize recommendations and to sequence them. Let's remember that the final product of your committee as well as everybody's committee is to have recommendations that really focus on the first 12 to 18 months of the next chief's tenure. Um, so we're really gonna need to see priorities and the sequence. So what needs to happen first? What can happen immediately? What can happen in 12 months? What can happen in 18 months? Obviously, we will also include recommendations for longer term. We also wanna track any recommendations that go beyond MNPD that might be for other Metro departments or divisions for considerations for uh, Metro National at large. Um, so I wanted to be sure that you and your committee understand the relationship between the data committee and your work. So I can, I can stop there. I do have a couple of other updates if you'd like me to continue. Thank you, Ms. Bilal. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I have a quick question, and I think you said this. I just wanted to clarify. So you had said that there was crossover among and between the three committees on some of the things that we were requesting. And I was just curious, when we have this data page that we can all go to, will all three committees be going to the same one so that maybe somebody else has thought of something we haven't that would be helpful to us and it would be nice for it to be there. Thank you so much, Ms. Bilal, for your comment. And yes, um, so on SharePoint, um, as many of you know, we are all on, you know, sort of the MS Office uh, environment. And so SharePoint is the shared document environment. And uh, we have a beta version working right now, and we're getting some of the quirks out of it um, so that um, my aim is to have it launched next week. Um, SharePoint will be one place for all commission members to access for all data that have been made available. Um, and That's, great. That's great. Thank you so much. And I also just wanted to add as well, 
that um, I think as the police chief, as the candidates um, begin to be part of who we're considering, they will probably want to see this data as well. So mm -hmm. or pieces of it that we would want to release to them too. So I think it's great that we're putting this together. I think it'll have many people using it for good purposes. Excellent. Madam Chair, if I may, I just have a few more quick comments. Of course, please. Um, so we will be joined on the data committee by Dr. Um, Baylor, who's here. Um, and so he'll be representing the MNCO. We will also be joined by one of the chief data scientists um, from MNPD um, as well. So we can go through, um, you know, the committee will be specifically looking at the data. Part of that process is data validation. Um, so part of that process is looking at some of the inconsistencies in the data. Um, but I hope that's not the only focus. I hope we can also get to really looking at some of the disparities that we can already see in the level set packet. Um, that said, um, I did want to be sure that committee members um, were aware that we are hosting two brown bag lunches next week. The first is on Tuesday, September 15th at noon until 1 p.m. Um, and that one will focus on pre-arrest diversion and psych triage, which is the um, uh, crisis treatment center, um, which is often referred to as the mental health project, um, which is in partnership with MNPD. And so on that, we will have um, mental health co-op present. Uh, Amanda Brock will be represented there. Um, we will also have MNPD represented by uh, Deputy Chief Damian Huggins, who's been a part of this project um, from the MNPD side. And we will also have Angie Thompson from the Div Division of Behavioral Health and Wellness um, as they've been involved, as we have been involved in the systems change piece on this. On Wednesday, September 16th at noon, we are going to be looking at interpersonal violence, specifically issues of domestic violence and sexual assault, and the work um, that the YWCA and that um, the Sexual Assault Center have been doing in partnership with MNPD. Um, there are good practices in these uh, presentations um, that um, hopefully uh, the commission would consider um, you know, support moving forward. Um, but it's really important uh, that everybody in the commission uh, understands what's already being done. Um, these presentations will be recorded um, and will be made um, available through the Metro Nashville YouTube site. Uh, so those uh, recordings will be available publicly as well. And uh, that's it for my updates. Happy to take any more questions. Thank you, Ms. Cirillo. Any questions from the committee here? I have one. Um, yes. you, who is the um, representative from MNPD who is going to be joining the data committee? You said Dr. Valier from the MNCO, and who was it? Did you mention a name? Uh, Matt Morley, I believe Matt is Morley. his name. Matt Morley. And wasn't that, if I'm not mistaken, the person who did that report? Um, the yes, 2019 he is. report, mm -hmm. isn't he the author of that? Okay, great. That's wonderful that he's part of that. Thank you. Any additional questions? Ms. Lucas, any other questions from you? I see you back muted. Okay, fantastic. Um, so members of the committee here, um, based on what you've heard here, is anyone have both the capacity and ability and willingness to, to step in and, and serve here. And Ms. Cirillo, did I miss when the, the meetings will take place weekly? So the first meeting will be an hour long meeting and it will take place on uh, Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, uh, September 16th in the morning. Um, once um, I will be contacting folks tomorrow morning, if, uh, if there are any significant conflicts, we will be sure to find a time that everybody can join. It will, the initial meeting will be a virtual meeting and in that meeting we will find a mutually beneficial time for everybody to meet moving forward and how we wanna structure um, the conversation. I have some thoughts, but I think it's important to hear also back from uh, members of the committee. Thank you. Ms. Chair, could I ask a question? Of course. I think your proposal 
brilliant. I think we need the shared data center. Can I ask all the documents that our committee has already been provided over the last couple of weeks, will those automatically be part of the SharePoint data center? Absolutely. Other, thank you. And my other question is, who's the representative from the Metro National Police Department that will serve on the data center? Do you have one yet by name? Yes, I believe it's Matt Morley. I believe I have his last name correct. Thank you. And this was great questions. And go back here. Anyone um, anyone willing or have the capacity here? I also realize that we all have a lot going on um, here. So this is a, an ask. Um, I believe the the other two committees, Ms. Arilla, if I'm correct here, have already identified or shared the name of their representative. Am I right about that? Mm -hmm. So the Communities Committee has appointed David Esquivel, mm -hmm. and uh, Workforce has uh, appointed Daryl Talbert. Daryl Talbert. Okay, thank you. So it's well represented there. Um, okay, so it, I don't see anyone I'm moving here, and we can, uh, I'll, I'll take take this back. I know that we do need to get you an, an answer, uh, an answer quickly here. Um, if if there's lack of availability here, certainly, this, you know, leaders in the space here, either me or Ms. Lucas will stand in here and participate. But I also think it would just be good to have a diversity of perspective beyond the, the folks like her and myself that are kind of putting the agenda together and, and speaking in other spaces. So um, we can continue on with the, the meeting. Um, and as uh, my grandmother would say, if the spirit hits you or moves you to unmute and, and sign up, please do. Um, and I welcome uh, folks to do so here um, and, and respect everyone's schedule as well. So we'll come back to this and I'm sure we'll uh, uh, have a solution before the end of the evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rillo. Anything else here before we uh, proceed? Okay, thank you so much. We'll move to Mr. Woods, who will uh, discuss the racial disparities in use of force tactics. Mr. Woods. Thank you, Madam. Let me say at the outset, it says 20 minutes on the agenda. I'm not going to take nearly that long. One reason being this is a total surprise to me when I got the agenda yesterday that I was going to be expected to make this report. But it's important, and it's broader than use of force. Racial discrimination is a serious problem, as we all know, for white America. The white America, including me, doesn't like to face up to, doesn't like to acknowledge, and it affects our police department, their performance, their reputation, their respect or lack of respect in the community. You know, I hope Nashville, I'm a lifelong resident, has the best police department in the nation. The gold standard for judging, for assessing police departments is the clearance rate. That's why the FBI collects that data every year and publishes it in a booklet called the Uniform Crime Report. And it's not critically, well, it's not critical, it's not important what the police in Nashville did last month or last week in isolation. Obviously, any police department can have a good month or a good week or a good year or a bad year. It's the trends that are important. As our clearance rate, which is how many crime calls, how many 911 calls, essentially, the police solve by an arrest or other exceptional means, every year, has their solution rate to crime gone up every year or has it gone down every year? That gives us a real picture of the gold standard for performance and effectiveness. If our police department's declining in their effectiveness, for example, and also having, I'll say too many, I've said it's paint with a broad brush, that brush that we, the community, somebody will have to define, if they're declining in effectiveness and performance as judged by the clearance rate, and the number of racial bias and other improper complaints are going up, we know we've got a serious problem in both directions with the police department. On the other hand, if their clearance rate's going up every year, like New York City did, and we learn that it's going up because they're beating people up on the streets with no cause and no provocation, as New York City police got sued for and lost finally after a five-year lawsuit last year, we don't want that either but we don't know how to stand back as a public policy committee and evaluate until we know what their clearance rate performance is over the last five years, 10 years, 15 years. I'm not trying to point a finger at any chief of police or any senior leadership. It's how we assess police departments. 
Second way we assess police departments in the criminal justice field is the rate of complaints. Now, obviously, whether we're talking about racial discrimination, or racial bias, or just abusive behavior or abusive language, or lack of respect by an officer toward a person they stop, et cetera, whatever the grounds of the complaint might be up to and including shootings, et cetera, you know, we as a committee, we're not gonna know now or when we finish how many of those complaints are valid or invalid. And I don't think, I don't think we're qualified or have the resources to undertake that kind of task. But what the rate of complaints does tell us that's very important, again, is the trend. Are the Nashville police getting more complaints every year or are they getting less complaints? Can we identify a trend that's happening? We can't know until we get that kind of data, obviously, but as with any organization, I'm sure they get complaints that are bogus and manufactured and ill thought out. And I'm sure like any organization, they get complaints that are valid. Uh, we need to hear from somebody in the police department at some point about how many of each are in that field and what's the trend for the, let's call them invalid, although again, I'm painting too broadly, versus valid complaints. The data they've sent us so far on use of force, and notice complaints are much, much wider and broader than just use of force, but the data they've sent us so far on use of force is alarming. The report that we got last week, that's dated December 2019, and I'm not gonna go into a great detail about this. I think we're all better off if we wait for the SharePoint data center to be set up and what I direct your attention to in that December 2019 report is table three. Uh, I think it's page five, but it's table three. Table three is where the National Police Department attempts to argue our use of force has not been racially biased. Now, we know from the 2015 President's Task Force on Policing in the 21st Century that almost every police department in the country has suffered from racial bias, racial discrimination in the use of force. They document that with the statistics over and over again in those task force reports. And, and obviously I'm assuming that 2015 report will be part of our data center. I'll, I'll put it in an email just to uh, help remind uh, Ms. Cirillo. There's a lot of very good uh, policy discussion and data in that national report. Bottom line in the national report, and again, it was in one of the documents we got last week in one paragraph, the National Center on Police Equity, I think was the author of it. They pointed out that the average nationwide on use of racial bias and use of force is that black persons are the subject, the victim of irresponsible or illegal or discriminatory use of force at a rate 2.6 times higher than white people. You know, we live in a country where there are three times more white people than there are black people, and yet the statistics are just the opposite on use of force. It tells us something's going on there. Is it just racial bias, or is it incompetent police officers? Uh, I think Nashville, as I've said both in this committee and in an email or two, I think Nashville has a pretty good training program. Is it the best? I don't know. Uh, I think it's a good training program that does a good job. I think it's too limited. I think it needs to be doing more training about implicit racial bias. I think it needs to be doing more training for management officers who are promoted up to sergeant and lieutenant in the police force. I don't think they get enough training. But for training rookies and new recruits, I think they do a heck of a good job. Maybe some of prove me wrong, but that's been my impression uh, over the years, really. It's just too limited, the training program. And we're getting racially biased use of force, regardless of the training program. And that gets me to my more important point. We need to be looking at transparency and accountability. Whatever policies we recommend, whether in training or the drug strategies I proposed a couple of weeks ago, or constant use and access to body cameras, et cetera, whatever policies we recommend, they're only as good as the practices that are really carried out by this organization. Police are no different than every organization we've all dealt with in various roles and aspects all our lives. If the leadership of the organization says to the officers, don't worry about the policies, I've got your back. If the leadership says, I'm not concerned about policies one, two, three, and four, you can just, you know, if you need to, you can ignore those. If the leadership is not held accountable, 
then the policies are not going to be implemented. You know, it's hard to teach white people not to discriminate. I've tried a lot of it in my lifetime. Uh, and, and I'm not picking just on white people. Uh, it's hard to train black people about some things too. Uh, black police officers engage in racial discrimination. We see it in use of force examples across the country every year. It's not just white officers doing it. The failure there is that some of our officers are racially biased. That's never gonna change. I wish I could say it was, but we all know no matter what we do and recommend, that's never gonna change. Maybe we can minimize it, but what I know we can do is hold police officers accountable, starting with the chief of police and then down to the deputy chief of police level, then down to the commanders, et cetera. If we adopt policies saying, chief of police, we wanna report every month or every year, depending on what subject we're talking about, on what's happening in use of force, on what's happening on the clearance rate, on what's happening with X, Y, and Z, and if it shows problems, we're going to have, hold you responsible, Chief of Police or Deputy Commander or whoever. We need accountability. We need as part of our policies to recommend that there be more transparency because if we don't know what's going on, there's no way to hold them accountable. And what happens is because the police deal in so much confidential information, they really act in secret a lot. They don't want word to get out, of course, if they're going to conduct a drug raid next week. They don't want word to get out that they're investigating that conspiracy. They don't want word to get out. Yeah, you can imagine and picture very clearly. Therefore, the police tend to operate very secretively or their inherent nature, not criticize them for it, but therefore there's no real accountability. When's the last time any member of the committee thought the chief of police should be fired? Uh, I deal with police all the time and I can't remember thinking that. Uh, because I don't have enough information to form a ballot opinion about that kind of thing. The mayor needs that kind of information. The city council needs that kind of information. And I know Russ Pulley with his serving as chair of the public safety committee and other council members doing the same thing. They have the opportunity to ask questions. They have the opportunity to grill some of the people who are ought to be responsible. But as we all know with our city council, it's not a full-time job. They don't have real staff. They don't have resources they can't do the job by themselves. We've got to have policies requiring transparency, which is why I think body cameras can solve that problem for us, or any alternate system that'll solve it. And once we've got the transparency, then we can identify racial bias or incompetency or failure to live up to the police department's own standards and do something about it. And the way to do something is not to discipline or reprimand the individual officer, although that may be necessary, the way to accomplish change, institutional change in the culture, is to say to the chief of police and the deputy chief and the commanders, you are the people who are hold responsible. If men and women working under your guidance screw this up, we're gonna discipline you. We're gonna hold you superiors, you leadership responsible. That's the only way any organization or business is ever effective if the people in charge have their feet held to the fire. We're not doing that currently. Very few jurisdictions are with their police department because of the secretive nature of the police department, because of the difficulty of getting current information, accurate information. So I'm not here to preach about racial, racial bias. I assume everybody on this committee is just like me. You've read the stories, heard the stories, seen the stories of racial bias, both explicit and implicit every day of your life. Uh, you have to make a concerted effort to avoid hearing this story. We can't solve all those problems, but we can make headway if we focus, I think, on transparency and accountability and adopting and pushing for eight can't wait type policies, de-escalation, uh, all the things that are already being talked about. We ought to encourage all that, but we've got to have transparency and accountability would be what I really would preach. With that, I'll stop. Thank you, Mr. Woods. Uh, let me uh, pause first and foremost before I um, stay here. Is there any member of the committee have any questions or comments here as to what Mr. Woods has shared with us? Are we in agreement here, though? I, I do uh, feel free to un unmute if uh, necessary and just begin to speak. But I, I want to make sure that as a committee, uh, we agree that it is important that we have an awareness uh, of 
uh, of any racial um, disparate, disparate impact that may have occurred or is that, that may be a part of the story that the data could show us because that will help us also, uh, back to our earlier point, prioritize if we're said um, we're only able to get two out of the three within the next week, then we know we, we certainly want to focus in on those uh, priority areas. Um, and the good news that we hear now is that any data we receive, everyone will receive. But I do think that uh, we'd be remiss as a, a committee if we don't take intentional action here. And just uh, I'd be also, I've got to use this space to say, too, that it's important that we think about intent versus impact here. Asking for this data, looking at it, reviewing it, in no way says that we, we don't believe we don't have well-intentioned, dedicated officers and, and law enforcement uh, officials. It does mean, however, that the impact may not be as such. And there's an opportunity for us to make um, positive change here. Um, every single one of us fall victim to intent to it versus impact every single day uh, in our actions, um, uh, whether it's personal, professional, or otherwise. And so we, but that does in no way uh, paint anyone with a bad uh, color here. And so I think that's important here. Miss um, Lucas, I see you unmuted there. Yeah, I just have a quick question for Larry. Um, and this just shows that I'm not really um, familiar with this concept. Where, uh, could you tell me a little bit more about why the clearance rate and the rate of complaints is considered the gold standard? Maybe Dia being the data guru, I'm gonna call you that, <laughs> whether you would call you that. You can call me all the names you want to. <laughs> <laughs> but like, where, where is that from, that those are the gold standards for evaluating that's, the efficacy of a police department? That's what you'll find on every university campus in the departments that study police administration, the textbooks. Uh, won't necessarily be the first chapter, but that's what you'll find. For, for anybody on the committee who, who hasn't followed police work, let's let you and I talk about it a minute, because I know your background, you know a lot of this, uh, or all of it probably. Uh, the crime rate, the crime rate is not what we should use to judge the effectiveness of the performance of the police department. You see a lot of news articles, social media saying this police department is, is a bunch of crooks and incompetence because the crime's going up or it's going this way or that way. The police are just like you and me. Obviously, they can't control and stop people in advance from committing a crime. Uh, the police are not the people that lead the bad folks in our community to commit crimes. They're the people, the guardians, who we use to protect us from the bad folks who commit the crimes. So whether crime's going up in Nashville or down should not be blamed on the police department. Okay. Historically, nationwide, Crime zoomed up starting in the 1960s for about 25 years. And then for the last 25 years, crime's been steadily coming down. A lot of that has to do with the age groups of uh, young people tend to commit more crimes than old folks like me. They got more energy, uh, got more problems probably. Uh, and, and age of the demographic uh, structure has a lot to do with that probably. I just want to emphasize, I'm not talking about the crime rate. So what should we judge the police by? Well, I'm gonna keep the numbers low because math's not my uh, strong suit. Let's say we have 100 crimes committed in Nashville last year. Uh, if we're lucky, we'll solve 65 of them. That'd be a high clearance rate in my judgment, in my opinion. Uh, murder cases, we ought to solve almost all of those. <laughs> murder is the most serious crime. It gets the most attention, the most resources. Burglary cases, the most common of the major crimes, we're not going to solve very many of those. They they just don't lend the very nature of the crime. It's in secret, usually nobody's home, middle of the night. Uh, the goods stolen usually aren't of high dollar volume. All kinds of reasons why the clearance run burglary, if it's 25 or 30%, we're probably hitting the national average. So murder clearance rate ought to be, gosh, 80, 90%. Burglary clearance rate, unfortunately, is probably going to be 25 or 30 percent, and the others at various points there. And when I say solve, I don't mean somebody gets convicted and sentenced to jail or prison. That's not the responsibility of the police. That's the responsibility of Tory Johnson's old office, the DA's office, the prosecution, the judges. You know, I could arrest the correct people that committed the crime all day long, but if the case gets mishandled in court, they might get acquitted or it might get dropped or who knows. So we don't judge the police by what happens in terms of convictions. That's not their responsibility. 
They're supposed to investigate and make an arrest if it's appropriate. So we're going to match of those 100 crime reports, <coughs> excuse me, of the 100 crime reports, if they arrest somebody in 55 of those cases, that's a 55% clearance rate. They've done their job, everything they can do in 55% of the cases. They then may clear a few more, move it up to 65 or 70% by saying, here's another 15 cases that will never be solved by arrest because we've identified the perpetrator as John Smith over here and John Smith's dead. So it's never gonna be solved, but we know who it was, so we're closing that file and that counts as a clearance. So therefore, police department should be judged by the clearance rate. It's their job to investigate. We should not expect 9 in 100% clearance because everybody's human. You're never gonna solve all the crimes and problems, uh, but we should expect a high clearance rate on murder and serious cases and as high as we can get on others. What I really want to know is, I want to see the national clearance rate and then compare it to Louisville and Jacksonville and San Diego, because if, and I'm making this up, if San Diego's hitting 80% clearance rate across the board for the last 10 years in a row, we need to be camped out at the San Diego Police Department and ask them, what are you doing to be the most, one of the most effective police departments in the nation? Now that doesn't address racial bias and other problems we're also concerned with, but it's the starting point. Have we got a really, really good police department and if so, why? If we don't, let's look at some of the ones that are and ask them the same question. Why are you doing so much better than everybody else? Thank you so much. That really helps, Larry. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. West. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair uh, Lucas, as well. Any additional comments or questions here before we move forward um, with the uh, next part of our agenda here? And with that, certainly we'll keep in mind, um, and I did promise the committee who would hear an update as it relates to outstanding data requests. Um, but we will also use this as an underpinning for all of our three uh, focus groups in areas, or rather four, am I right, Vice Chair Lucas, it's four now? <laughs> I was still on five. Uh, five focus groups as well. I think that's an important way to focus on that. Thank you, everyone. We'll proceed here and um, welcome Dr. Peter Villar, uh, a lead researcher uh, and analyst, excuse me, lead research analyst for MNCO. Here, uh, we thank you, Dr. Valier, for being here with us. I know also Ms. Uh, uh, Orozco is with us as well, and we'll hear possibly from her later on today. But with that, Mr. Valier, Dr. Valier, you have the floor. All right, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to see. I don't know if I'm showing up on the camera, but um, if I can be made the presenter so I can share my screen, that would be helpful. See here. Um, Kenya might have to do that since she's the host. Okay, Miss Gilchrist. Let's see what we can uh, do here. Miss Crawford or Mr. Button, Mr. Rillo, do you by chance have Miss? Uh, great. No, I'm 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 able to share now. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry about that. I was unable to mute my mic for a second. <laughs> no problem. Good evening. Okay, so now uh, you should be able to see the presentation. Um, so my name is Peter Valier. I'm the lead research analyst from Metro Nashville Community Oversight. And I do want to see if I can get my camera to show up. <laughs> but it doesn't seem to want to work right now. Um, we can certainly hear you. And Dr. Blair, would you mind uh, putting that in presentation mode just so it's a bit larger on the screen? Let's use it. It's full screen on my side. So if Actually, you sorry. click on from beginning, Peter, on that slideshow, it'll bring it up bigger for us to see. Oh, I, sorry, I shared the wrong screen. I apologize. Okay, that should be the presentation now. All right. Um, so I, as I was started, I'm, I'm the lead research analyst for Metro National Community Oversight. 
we are the support agency for uh, the Community Oversight Board and uh, our office um, conducts investigations as well as research and evaluation and produces policy reports um, that the COB is then able to make policy recommendations. Uh, my background, I'm by training, I'm a sociologist. So I have my PhD is in sociology from Vanderbilt. Um, my, while I was studying, I, I worked on the Driving While Black report as uh, conducting the quantitative analysis and was a co-author of that report. I also wrote my dissertation on Metro Nashville Police Department and focused on uh, discretionary searches during traffic stops and racial disparities within those searches and then mental health consequences of policing in Nashville. Um, prior to going to graduate school, I worked in a nonprofit as a social worker, a medical social worker, and um, specifically was focused on HIV and substance abuse. And so I have uh, a bit of background uh, looking at some of the social problems that are related to policing and some of the issues in our society, as well as from an academic perspective, as well as a practical perspective. Um, so basically during this presentation, I'm gonna be, since I'm a sociologist, I'll be starting with a little bit of theory as a framing and introduction and talking about the framing and role of police in society before jumping into consent decree recommendations. Uh, we looked at 14 consent decrees and we broke out the recommendations from those around use of force into actually using force, training around force, crisis intervention, reporting, investigating, and reviewing force, and research and evaluation. I also have added a section on the NIJ Sentinel Event Initiative, which I think is a, also a very interesting and helpful um, supplement to some of the consent decree recommendations. Um, our goal with the fact sheet that we sent uh, was to give you all a broad overview of what is in consent decrees. And um, many of the pieces in that, in that report our police department already does. And I think it, hopefully it'll give you some places to start asking questions and places to think about where our police department is and where it can be improved. Um, so with that, I'm going to start with just a bit of background and focusing really on the bigger picture. And as a sociologist focused on criminology, um, I really start with the punitive turn that our society and our criminal justice took in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, this punitive turn was focused on the war on drugs, war on crime, and as as, uh, as Professor Wood said uh, we, there was a increase in crime through, this, through the 1960s to 19, early 90s that um, was associated with this. And, and that was addressed through a punitive stance towards crime. Scholars who uh, study this era uh, have argued that this is a response to the civil rights movement and that this turn was particularly racialized and you can see that in the war on drugs and how that's impacted communities of color. Michelle Alexander argued that this, that the resulting system of policing, prosecution, and incarceration is the new Jim Crow and is one of the drivers and main perpetuate, perpetuating forces of racial inequality in our society. And to put a little bit of framing on mass incarceration, black men born since 1970, about one fifth have served time in jail or prison. And we know, but we know this is concentrated um, in particular parts of communities of color and black men without a high school diploma, nearly 70% have been incarcerated in their lifetime. And this is incredibly unprecedented um, globally and also temporally. So where we are now as far as who we're incarcerating is unprecedented. And, this, and Nashville has not been immune to this. 14% of the children born from 1980 to 1986 living in 37208, which is North Nashville, were incarcerated in 2012. So this is a one snapshot, one point in time, 14% of children uh, born in that period were incarcerated. And when you expand that out uh, to, uh, to the lifespan, people who might have already gotten out of prison, that number could be much higher. 
Um, I also have taught in prison and taught sociology in prison, and many of my students fall come from this age bracket and from that neighborhood. We also know from quite a bit of research that Black people are more likely to experience unfair treatment from police. Um, in a study of Nashville, a survey conducted from 2012 to 2014, 25% of the Black respondents reported that they'd experienced unfair treatment in their lifetime, compared to 10% of the white respondents. And what's important about this time period, 2012 to 2014, in 2012, the police department made nearly 450,000 traffic stops. And in that year, and over that time period, they made more stops of Black drivers in a year than there were Black people living in Nashville. This survey also showed that 9% of Black respondents reported that they've been treated unfairly by police just in the past year. And that was in compared to just over 1% of white respondents. And beyond this, beyond just personally being, reporting and perceiving um, unfair treatment, an additional 22% of Black respondents said that they had not personally experienced unfair treatment, but a family member or close friend had had experienced unfair treatment, and that was compared to 8% of whites. So what you can see is about 45, or just over 45% of black respondents in Nashville, and in a representative survey of the population of Nashville, reported at some point in their life they've been treated unfairly. And that is a very different from the experience of, um, of white Nashville residents. And furthermore, what I think is really interesting about uh, this research is unfair police treatment um, in Nashville from the, this study has been linked to not only uh, or, or to health disparities. So this unfair treatment has been linked to racial disparities in physiological health biomarkers, um, which lead to premature mortality, as well as waist circumference, which is a risk factor for metabolic diseases and um, diabetes and, and other conditions and cardiovascular illnesses, as well as depressive symptoms, um, which I uh, studied in my dissertation. So as we're, as we're keep thinking about that and about the racial disproportionality of policing in the criminal justice system, I think it's important to think about the role of police and what we expect of police. Uh, the sociologist Egon Bittner, who uh, was a sociologist at Brandeis University, in, uh, in 1970 he wrote that the role of police is to address all sorts of human problems when and insofar as their solutions do or may possibly require the use of force at the point of occurrence. So he really thought that what, what police define police was their ability, not necessarily that they do use force, but their ability to use force to get some sort of outcome. So when they show up to a scene, what people are calling the police for is have some sort of non-negotiable outcome. And that comes through having the ability to exercise coercive force. And he argued that that is, that is the underlying principle of law enforcement, that the potential to use force to, to force an outcome underlies everything that law enforcement does. And we see this actually in the force continuum where officers are trained that everything from uniform presence all the way to deadly force uh, constitutes a use of force of some variety, of, diff of, a, of a continuum and scale. Since Bittner's work, we've expanded the scope of policing uh, to manage all types of social problems that law enforcement is neither trained nor equipped to respond to. So law enforcement has picked up the pieces, so to say, of um, issues around poverty, substance abuse, mental illness, and every officer I've spoken with has said that, that they are not equipped to solve the issues that they're called to every day. So then the question really comes to what types of, of issues do, should police be responding to? And this really gets to the core of reimagining public safety. And Bittner in 1970 wrote, what are policemen supposed to do is almost exact, is almost completely identical to the question, what kinds of situations require remedies that are non-negotiably coercible or that require the type of co coercive force? And so I think this is really 
a question that this committee is gearing to answer is what are the situations that really are the scope of police and what are the situations that might not be? And as we look nationwide, this really is one of the core um, questions that people are asking around when, how do we reimagine public safety? So I, I bring this up as context for discussing consent decrees. And so consent decrees address policy and policy has an important role here. And as you know, as, as a policy committee, um, policy is important. And these are administrative standards when we're talking about policy. We're not talking about legal standards. The administrative standards are, um, are used to inform officers of what is expected and also to hold officers accountable um, for department-issued discipline. We have re good research that shows that, that agencies with more restrictive, less lethal force policies have fewer uses of force. And I think it's good evidence that to show that we that more restrictive policies and more comprehensive policies, not necessarily always restrictive, but comprehensive policies um, help guide officers in their decision making when using force. Comprehensive policy also gives clarity to officers and community members on what is and what is not allowed. And so one concern you often hear is that officers may not know what what is expected of them. And, and when you have comprehensive policy that clearly lays out what is and what is not allowed, that, get, that really helps both officers and community members know what to expect. Policies are used for administrative investigations and hold officers accountable to agency expectations and hopefully to community expectations as well. So to really dig into some consent decrees, the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division can investigate police departments, and if they find constitutional violations, they can bring a civil lawsuit against the city. Most of these lawsuits are, are, are related to excessive use of force and illegal searches, and those are uh, core in constitutional protections. The DOJ, importantly, is examining patterns and practices, not specific instances of, um, of bias or excessive force. So they, while they do look at, at instances and, and audit reports, they're looking for patterns and practices that might violate the Constitution. The consent decree is a result of that lawsuit. It's a settlement agreement between the city and the Department of Justice. And what, one way to think about these is that is the consent decrees are the roadmaps that other cities have taken to reform. And the Department of Justice is um, run by lawyers who are working with um, some of the um, most recent best practices around uh, police reform. And these, this is what, these are the uh, recommendations that they are coming up with. Um, so to get into actually what those recommendations are, we looked at 14 consent decrees focused on use of force, and, and we were pulling out the major findings. There's a lot in there. They're usually three to 400 page documents, um, but we're really focused on trying to get the core ideas out of them. One of the main um, core ideas is that de-escalation should be required whenever possible. And this is something that's been coming up quite a bit in your conversations. Um, and and de-escalation is really about being able to give time to, sub to subjects to comply, right? So buying time, using distance and cover in order to uh, be able to de-escalate and get that person into custody uh, safely. Officers should be de-escalating as resistance decreases. So they should be matching and using proportionate force. They should be taking into account men mental and medical conditions that might be present. Uh, consent decrees also say that each force option available to officers should have comprehensive policies and definitions. So each aspect of the force continuum should be clearly defined in policy so that an officer might know, all right, this technique is would be considered a soft empty hand technique versus a hard empty hand technique. And so they're able to have clear definitions as they're navigating, learning, 
and reviewing their, um, their training. Policies also should prohibit some action. And I'm not gonna read the entire list since you have seen this in the fact sheet, but many of these are constitutional violations, uh, but, in use, but some common prohibitions are things like using a firearm as an impact weapon, neck holds or choke holds or carotid holds, head stripes, um, using force against restrained individuals, um, warning shots, those are, those are often prohibited and recommended as prohibitions by consent decrees. On training, they, they tend to focus on the, the types of training that are required to different groups. So for recruits and in-service training, um, often the consent decrees re uh, require that, that these trainings are focused on policies in the Fourth Amendment and Fourth Amendment law, decision-making and ethics, de-escalation skills, role-playing and scenario-based trainings, reporting, investigation, and reviewing of use of force incidents, um, and weapon-specific training on all approved weapons and that officers must requalify annually on each approved weapon. They also draw out supervisor training, and specifically for supervisors, they should also be trained to conduct investigations on use of force, manage use of force incidents, counsel officers on how to minimize force or intervene when they see excessive or unreasonable force, and support officers who report unreasonable force and who are afraid of retaliation. They also recommend force investigation team training. Force investigation teams are specialized units that um, that investigates serious uses of force, and that, that's a common recommendation in many of the consent decrees. And this specialized training um, would cover how to conduct investigations into serious uses of force and would be required for force investigation team members. On crisis intervention, uh, consent decrees typically recommend instituting crisis and intervention teams, and, and the model that's being recommended is the Memphis model, which started in Memphis in 1988 and has been in practice there since. This is a 40-hour training for new CIT officers and eight-hour in-service annually afterwards. Um, they also say that all, all trainees should receive basis, basic crisis training, and dispatchers should also be trained to appropriately route calls to CIT. But we also have multiple models that are in existence around the country. And these range from more police-based models to more community-based models. On the more police-based side, you have crisis intervention officers, which is a CIT model, which is a Memphis model. Um, you have law enforcement referrals to case management. Uh, this is also referred to as LEAD or the Law Enforcement, Enforcement Assisted Diversion Programs. You have officer civilian co-response models, and an example of that is the LAPD Mental Evaluation Unit. You have dispatched non-police responders that are government-based. So a, a good example of a brand new program is the Albuquerque Community Safety Department, which has gone through a two-year planning phase and is now becoming is now operational where calls are diverted from a, uh, into a new department focused on community safety that covers a wide range of calls where law enforcement um, may not be the most appropriate tool. And then finally, you have dispatched non-police peer service support models or peer support lot services. And one of the examples of this is the CAHOOTS uh, program in Eugene, Oregon, where it's a third party organization that is dispatched uh, to uh, calls related to crisis and mental health. On reporting, investigating, and reviewing force, uh, consent decrees argue that force should be tracked and investigated based on the severity of force. So they typically recommend a three-level categorization system. So level one is any force used to overcome active resistance that does not cause injury so that, and that includes displaying firearms or displaying tape. Level two force would be any use of force which causes an injury, could reasonably be expected to cause an injury or results in a complaint of an injury. And so this would include hard empty hand control techniques, taser deployment, impact weapons, or OC spray. 
Level three are the serious uses of force. And so these are likely to cause serious injury, including all firearm discharges, except if it's at a range, um, more than three taser cycles on an individual, head, neck, sternum, spine, groin, or kidney strikes, and improperly applied force. Um, different departments who have, who have implemented these levels have made different decisions about what goes into those different levels. Uh, for instance, New Orleans considers more than two taser cycles to be a level three force. And they also include any supervisor's uh, force if they're above the level of a sergeant. Um, for level one force, these are relatively minor instances um, to overcome resistance that are not like cause injury. So supervisors should review these. Often the report forms are, sh are shorter than you would use for a level two report. Um, but these should be reviewed by a supervisor and a supervisor can determine whether the level is correct. All, all level two uses of force should be should be um, responded to at the scene by a supervisor and investigated. Um, the supervisor would lead the investigation, interviewing officers and witnesses about the incidents, taking photos of any injuries. And then this investigation should be reviewed by the chain of command, which would ultimately would end up with the chief of police. And finally, they recommend that a force investigation team should investigate all level three uses of force for both criminal and administrative investigations. So the FIT teams are would invest do both criminal and administrative investigations. Often these are underneath the umbrella of an internal affairs unit, but are separate from misconduct investigations um, from other forms of misconduct. And that's really to, in, to try to uh, create a specialized unit that's the experts on force for the for the department that is really highly focused and specialized on, on conducting these serious force investigations. Um, force, the force review board should then review all level three uses of force and in the investigations for any policy violations. And finally, on um, research and evaluation, um, consent decrees tend to recommend that the department annualize, annually analyze and release a public report on use of force trends. Um, and there's a lot, there's actually a lot of very good examples of reports from other departments, um, those with consent decrees and without on putting out use of force reports. And then some, a few consent decrees um, include routine audits and reviews of reports to identify any deficiencies in the reporting and review process. And then finally, this is not from consent decrees specifically, but the National Institute of Justice has a Sentinel Events Initiative. And this is a, this actually is inspired by the medical practice of reviewing deaths. And these, what, what happens in complex organizations is that bad outcomes can happen. And those are not necessarily the fault of an individual officer or an individual person, but they're often indicative of complex systems failures. So the question really is, even in those cases where an officer is found to be within policy, um, especially in, in shootings, this, um, these reviews could come into account. So in that context of, of police shootings, an officer might be justified according to law and policy, but the department should have an in-depth evaluation of how to minimize the odds that a similar shooting will happen again. And so when, you, when we see multiple shootings happen that are similar, the question really becomes, what could have been done in order to identify any, um, any deficiencies or any complex systems failures in earlier shootings that could have prevented a later death? And I think that's an important part of review. And this would be separate from, from the scope of a force review board, though it could be combined, because force review board tend to be focused on whether or not it was in within policy and any discipline stemming from that, where this is not about blaming an officer or blaming an individual, but trying to understand the complex factors that led to a, a death at the hands of, of the state, because this is a state institution that, with, that has taken a life and that no officer wants that. And so anything that can be done in order to prevent one death in the future um, 
should be a priority. And to really expand on this medical analogy, um, Bittner wrote in 1970 that policemen must acquire the attitude of physicians who take pride in employing all available means to avoid surgery and who, when surgery is unavoidable, take pride in making the smallest possible incision. And the officers that, most of the officers I know, this is absolutely their perspective, that they wanna use the least amount of force possible. And when they have to use force, they wanna use as little as they can, um, only what's absolutely necessary. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions. I have a list of references for you all. Um, and I, We'll be, I'll be sending these slides to uh, Ms. Davis um, as soon as I finish. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions from the committee. Thank you, Dr. Valier. Thank you very much. Any questions here from the committee? Um, Ms. Davis, will this um, presentation, uh, will it be available to us to review later or or will it be of the, I guess, where Ms. Cirillo is going to collect all the, the paperwork and study for us? I think the answer to that is, is yes to both. Uh, Dr. Valier's uh, plan, as I understood at the very end here, was to share it uh, by email. Dr. Blair, would you mind also sharing that with uh, Vice Chair Lucas at the same time, if you um, wouldn't mind? And then we will immediately forward that out to the entire committee. So um, it sounds like Dr. Blair has plans to send it to us as soon as he concludes tonight. So that means we'll have it to you by this evening as well, Mr. Robinson. Thank you. Um, great question, though. And I do think to your latter point, too, that this presentation should be a part of the larger SharePoint site that all commission members have access to as well. Um, to, there's a lot of incredibly important information, um, even for the other committee members. Any additional questions here on the information we've um, just heard here, Ms. Lucas? Yes, hi, um, Dr. Valier. I have a question. You had mentioned the number of 450,000 stops. Um, did I get that number right? Uh, was that here in Nashville? Yes, or that's correct. That, um, in 2012, there were nearly 450,000 traffic stops. Um, that's an astonishing number. And um, I know that you said in your introduction, and I know I met you, um, I am a volunteer with NOAA, and you came and presented a lot of the same information. So thank you. First of all, I should have prefaced my remarks by saying thank you so much for this information. Um, I hesitate to use the word quota, but I don't know if I should. What is the information as to what the expectations are of officers in terms of making stops? Is 450,000 a reasonable amount of traffic stops for a city the size of Nashville? Is that actually, a, you know, kind of back to Larry's point, uh, um, he made the point earlier before you joined us about, um, you know, comparing us with comparable cities. Is that a high number? Is it not a high number? Was there an amount placed? Um, I know that was part of the concerns about our previous chief was that maybe his expectations regarding traffic stops may have um, been unreasonable. Could you give us a little bit more information along those lines? Absolutely. Um, so the number of traffic stops in 2012, that was the height of that, of that number. And that is absolutely much higher than um, any other peer city that I looked at and I've looked at several dozen, um, and so that is way outside of the norm. Um, since then, the number has declined, and in at the end of 2018, yeah, end of 2018, um, the policing project issued a report on traffic stops in Nashville, and so they followed up the uh, Driving While Black report, um, came to very similar conclusions, and they also contracted with the Stanford Policing um, Policing Initiative, Stanford Policing Project. One of the uh, 
Stanford Policing Initiative or something like that, um, in order to actually test whether that was effective at reducing crime. And what they found that was that the traffic stops had no relationship to the amount of crime in specific areas. And so right after that, within a month, the traffic stop, number of traffic stops plummeted dramat dramatically. And so I believe in 2019, the traffic stops was, I believe, around 60,000, but I, I'm not 100% confident on that number, um, but it's gone way down. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think when there was good evidence that that, that was not um, an effective practice, um, or I'm let me not say good evidence, when there was authoritative evidence from an independent research um, that was not a community group, that led to a decrease in stops. Um, the Gideon's Army report could have led to a decrease in stops and probably should have led to a more dramatic decrease in stops, but did not. Um, the driving a blackboard did not link it to crime, but was able to show that those numbers were way out of line for peer cities and was having a large disproportionate impact on communities of color in Nashville. And that's, I think, an important um, what is an important milestone in Nashville is, was that report, but then also really that that has trailed off. And I think when I talk to a lot of a lot of community members, it's a noticeable difference, and it's actually quite noticeable on um, the difference in traffic enforcement in Nashville. Um, stops are still being made, um, and but they're made with. Um, more of a focus to when they're needed instead of as a large scale tactic um, that's uh, seen to, in, to be effective for crime control, which it's not. So uh, this may not be a question that you're able to answer, but um, my recollection of the Driving While Black report is that while um, black residents were um, being pulled over at a much higher rate than white residents, those stops yielded fewer weapons uh, and drugs. Is, am I remembering that correctly? Yes. Um, okay. Especially in probable cause searches. Right, um, right, right. And so what we find in, in consent searches is that, or what we found about consent searches in the Driving While Black report was that they only found evidence of drugs or weapons in about 12% of mm -hmm. all searches. And that was a focus of my dissertation as well, where I use some of the uh, more recent analytical methods um, and simulation methods in order to really try to dig into what's going on with those searches. And um, when I estimated uh, racial, racial bias in the decision in order to conduct a traffic or in order to conduct a probable cause search during a traffic stop, um, I found that black drivers uh, were had lower level of probable cause than white drivers. So being black was de facto suspiciousness um, in order to justify a, an assertion of probable, probable cause. And um, my dissertation chapter was focused on officers in the first three years of their career um, who were all working on patrol. Um, very good. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. That's really helpful. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments here uh, for Dr. Galea? I had a question. Um, I'm sorry. I'm gonna, uh, I was curious. Did I understand correctly that in uh, your study that with departments where they train a more restrictive use of force, that there was a better outcome. Uh, I'm struggling to find the records to, to explain or to, to get my question out. But it just, it kind of goes contrary to what we heard last week from some of the uh, officers where they said that if a officer was trained well, that they were less likely to use that force that was available to them. So I, I would draw a distinction between trained well and um, 
having comprehensive restrictive policies. Um, so the policies themselves, when they are um, more restrictive and more clear prohibitions, um, when the force continuum is laid out in a more clear way, um, and there's an interesting paper on this where they compare departments and their number of use of force incident, incidents. Um, what they find is that the departments that have more restrictive policies have fewer use of force incidents. So that doesn't mean that they're not trained, right? So if you have more restrictive policies, you also should, will be getting similarly similar training that's training you in all of the tactics in order to use all of, all of those levels of force. And you'll be trained in those policies about um, de-escalation and the, and the points when you can um, use those higher levels of force. And that, those, that, those types of, of restrictions within policy is separate from the training. Um, so I just want to be clear that all officers should be receiving really comprehensive training about all types of force. Um, Can you speak to the levels of restrictions that Metro Nashville Police Department uh, has by compared compared to some of the other uh, departments that you might have done in your research or where we, where we fall? So the uh, departmental policies in Nashville on use of force tend to um, have many clear um, prohibitions on force. And um, I think when you compare them out to other cities, um, tend to be on par with some of the, with some of the with some of the cities that have good use of force policies. Um, there are cities that have more recent revamped policies that, that would probably be considered um, uh, was probably more closely aligned with the sort of more, most recent best, best practice. Um, and so, I mean, I'll, I'll say every policy has room for improvement. Um, and so, what I think is important for the policy committee to really be doing is to try to take in some of those best practices, ask a whole lot of questions around sort of what policy is, what it looks like, and then really sort of try to make a determination of whether that is kind of in line with what is um, recommended nationally. Thank you very much. Is that Ms. Bilal? You had a sick question? Yes, I had a quick question. I was really interested in your discussion about just the CIT teams, the crisis intervention teams. And you had one slide that showed kind of a continuum of police-based programs to community-based programs. I feel like when I look at national trends that that is probably the direction that most communities are wanting to go more towards some community-based programming. You specifically mentioned the Albuquerque um, Community Safety Department. Is that a program that you think that we should look at in more detail at this com in this committee as maybe an example of best practices? Um, I absolutely do. I think what you'll find is that many of those programs are new. Um, the Albuquerque Community Safety Department over the past two years, the city of Albuquerque has had a, um, a commission that has really dug into calls for service um, that you, they had a million calls for service every year going to the police department. And so they really dug into what are those calls? What, how can those be diverted to other resources? Um, and, you know, it might not be, be appropriate that we don't, may not need a law enforcement officer at every traffic accident. There might be another department in a city government that, you know, is better able to respond to traffic accidents. Um, there might, so some of those um, calls for service, when you really start digging into them, you know, come, you sort of start asking questions around how much of this is where we need law enforcement. And then what are the other resources? What, what could other city departments have? And I, so I think that is a good example to look at. Um, I think their process um, for creating that is a good example. Um, and then also with this continuum, I wanna, it's important to stress that 
cities can have multiple of these items. You can have crisis intervention trained officers as well as having dispatched, you know, having a city um, department focused on um, immediate safety needs, right? So you can have both of those at the same time and it probably would be most effective to have more officers being trained in crisis intervention as well as having either co-responders co or, um, or a department that is able to be dispatched um, in order to respond to some of those um, immediate needs. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really, really like the thought of this and I think it also speaks to how you talked about policing has really been forced to pick up the pieces for poverty, substance abuse, mental health, all of these different issues that they don't have training and and why not use some of these community-based programs that do that already have the resources and the training to um, bolster some of these calls and not put it all in the back of law enforcement. I really love that idea and I would love um Madam Chair, to see if we can maybe reach out to the Albuquerque Community Safety Department and learn a little bit more about their program. It's a great suggestion. We'll work on that this week. Absolutely. Madam Chair, may I just jump in here for a second, please? Please, absolutely. Um, so I really encourage all um, of the committee members to attend Tuesday's brown bag lunch on the pre-arrest diversion program that exists here in Nashville that is hosted by the Mental Health Co-op. Um, that program was developed over about four years, I believe, if my math is correct. Um, Metro Public Health Department, and I'm revealing my um, ulterior motive here, uh, my employer, had been involved in the development of that model and they looked specifically at San Antonio and at an Arizona model. One of the challenges of Nashville looking at Oregon or New Mexico as a model is that both those states have expanded Medicaid. So when we think about how we support um, individuals presenting with mental health conditions and if we want, um, you know, trained clinicians um, or even peer support, um, it's really a question of where, where do those funds come from? Um, I think what is very exciting about the work that uh, the Mental Health Co-op has led um, in creating the 24-7 Crisis Treatment Center um, is that they've been able, and that we together are working with them and, and MNPD have been able to uh, roll back MNPD's role in, um, you know, um, working with individuals with uh, presenting with mental health conditions and inserting clinicians and individuals who are trained in the field um, of behavioral health. Um, and I think that's a pretty remarkable accomplishment in an environment in which we have not expanded Medicaid. And so I would encourage, I, I think it's very important for the committee to look at all sorts of models. I would just suggest for the purpose of time, energies, and efforts to wait till Tuesday to see the presentation and to ask specific questions about how does this relate to even that continuum. Um, I'd be happy to share with the presenters the continuum and so that they, they might be able to respond some, to some, some of those questions directly. Um, but we, we have an existing model that is working um, that is specific to the Nashville environment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Merlo. I, so let me just, I'm gonna be clear and thoughtful here. So when, once we have an opportunity, your recommendation is once we have an opportunity to hear um, the September 15th uh, presentation at uh, lunchtime uh, presentation, and to determine if we um, then need the opportunity to hear from additional or outside um, units, as um, Ms. Bilal is sharing. And I, I just, I missed a little part, it's probably my part of broken up, but on the Arizona, you mentioned Arizona there, is there already a contact mate there for us to hear from them in their perspective? Is that, is that what you were saying? Yeah, actually there were, um, there was extensive um, work done on the Arizona model and the San Antonio model. Um, because those were states that had not expanded Medicaid. 
Okay. So let me, um, let me also just, um, I can, I, I know we'll get more information from that. And I appreciate the, the point about uh, efficiencies also, but I also really appreciate Ms. Falal's point. I wonder also, and I know we're, we're uh, moving um, after this into the assignments and kind of the end of our meeting, if some of these subcommittees, if we find purpose in, in energy behind having, um, you know, consult and learning from, let's say, the Albuquerque Police Department, that perhaps the subcommittees um, could have a space where one of them reaches out um, and asks those questions, kind of top line questions, so that we know as a team if we want to invite them in for a larger conversation. And, and perhaps still we can wait until the Tuesday uh, meeting occurs, lunch occurs. But I also just, and, and I guess I'm feeling like many of you, I keep thinking about the short time frame we have and every day seems like a bit of a week if we don't move uh, quite uh, purposefully. And I think, Mr. Rillo, that's to your point, too, is that there's a finite amount of time here where we're trying to get things done. Um, it, it, am I correct about that, Mr. Rillo? And then also, Ms. Bilal, how do you feel about that approach um, since you made the recommendation? Sure, that's fine with me. I'm very familiar with the San Antonio program at the Family Justice Center, Maria Falcon, that actually created that program in San Antonio over a decade ago. It was first called DMOT. She was the creator of that, a very dear friend of mine. I spoke with her earlier this week just to kind of see if she might want to present to this committee. She's retired now, but she is um, the person that created that. She has a lot of criticisms about the current program now as it exists, um, which, you know, I think is often typical. So I think, um, I think, though, the whole concept of what the healthcare situation is in each state is very pertinent because if we don't have the funds to do it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, I guess, to particularly investigate it. But I'm very familiar with um, the CIT. They worked out of our Family Justice Center in San, in San Antonio. And if I unfortunately cannot make that brown bag. I have a conflict. I will try to see the recording of it, though. But after we do that, if people want me to reach out to any of the other um, community-based programs that were mentioned, I'm happy to do that because I do have an understanding of these teams and how they should work. That sounds like a great approach. Thank you, Ms. Blanc. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bello, as well. Um, Mr. Rillo, anything else you would add on that? I'm sorry if you didn't know if you were on mute. Uh, the only point is, is that I definitely think CIT is very relevant in uh, the context of Nashville. Uh, we do know that MNPD has trained um, some of its officers in CIT. Um, and, you know, I think we're all wondering if this is an opportunity to create a CIT unit. Uh, previously, there had not been an opportunity to do that. Um, and we do hope that under uh, the next chief, that might be a very good opportunity. Um, and I just want to extend to Ms. Bilal that um, I'd be delighted to discuss with her the model and share data and talk about what has happened, if that's helpful, and certainly to any other committee members, if they would like just some foundational background and, and happy to put them in touch with our speakers as well, if, if they would like. Be great. Thank you, Ms. Cirillo. Um, we are uh, still in the portion of the Q&A here with uh, Dr. Valier and Ms. Larisco um, as well. Is there any additional questions um, here from the body? Just wanted to make sure Madam we... Chair. Yeah, yes. Sorry, Madam Chair, Bob Allen, I have a question or two. Go ahead. Um, on the consent decrees I read on my uh, email, it says um, head strike. It doesn't really clarify with what. Would it be a fist, um, a baton, whatever? I just wondered uh, from the opinion what that was about. It just kind of says head strike and doesn't, doesn't really clarify anything else. Uh, thanks for pointing that out. Um, yeah, it, it, it head strikes with an impact weapon. Oh, with an impact weapon? Yeah, sorry, I will clarify that in future versions. Okay, then that solves that one. 
in the, the next one, let me go to it. It's uh, using a taser and drive stun mode solely as pain compliance. What's kind of meant by that one? I'm uh, sorry, what was the question? Uh, using, a taser, compliance. Uh, using a taser and drive stun mode solely as a pain compliance technique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so consent decrees, um, we find that's actually a, a recommendation across many different consent decrees. And um, what they found in different cities is that um, tasers and drive stun mode have been used um, inappropriately. Um, there was an incident in a neighboring county of someone uh, restrained with, with a taser being used in drive stun mode. Um, what they're concerned about is that in improper applications. And so that is a recommendation that's been, that was in many of the consent decrees. Okay. And I just wondered about that because um, I brought tasers to Nashville, Tennessee MNPD in 2004 and taught those for a number of years. And when taser probes miss or are ineffective, that's when we do drive stun mode um, and it's actually better and less use of force than using other techniques. But I'd hate to see that disappear just because some police officer in another city or other cities did something inappropriate. Um, and the officers here, you know, in, in my opinion, from teaching a bunch of them, have not done that. And if they do, obviously that's why we have OPA to discipline those officers or fire them. So just my opinion on that. All right, thank you. I think that's an excellent point that not all of these prohibitions are things that need to be prohibited in all cities. And it depend, a lot depends on the training and accountability structures in place. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any final uh, or additional for that matter? Questions or comments here from the committee? If not, then uh, Dr. Valeria, we thank you so very much for your time, uh, for spending your Thursday evening uh, with us. We, we thank both you and your colleague as well. Thank you so much, Mr. Roscoe. Thank you, and I'm always happy to have conversations with any of the commission members. Um, please feel free to reach out to me by, by email. You, will, you, you opened up a can of worms there because we like the email. I know I do, so I will, we will we'll be in touch with you. Thank you again. Uh, we'll uh, progress here and uh, extend the floor. Um, Ms. Lucas will lead us here. And the good news here, folks, I know we're near 8 o'clock, but we have um, absolutely satisfied more than even 90% of our focus here. So, Ms. Lucas. Okay. Hopefully you all have received um, the email that included the five different work assignment and issue areas. The, where I'd like to start, first of all, is by asking anybody if they have strong feelings. I know Mr. Allen had requested um, to be involved in training because it sounds like that's right in his wheelhouse. Um, so we have moved him from discipline to training. It, does anybody else have any strong feelings about um, something uh, about their assignment, about wanting a different task? Um, speak now or forever hold your peace. Anyone, anyone, viewer, viewer? Okay, great. So um, from these areas, these are certainly not exhaustive lists. These were just kind of some questions to get us started in thinking about some of the information that we might want to track down. Some of these may take the form of um, data requests to the um, committee. It may take the form of just kind of like Warwick reaching out to the um, academy and setting up our um, field trip. But has everybody had a chance to review this? Does anybody have any questions? Would anybody like me to um, clarify or expand on any of um, what we have put in place to get us started? Is anybody completely unclear as to what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. 
Dr. Jackson, I see you uh, unmuted there. Just want to make sure you're not trying to speak to us. Okay. Sounds like we're all clear though. Ms. Okay, great. So um, what would be really helpful is um, between now and next week, if you could touch base with your two or three um, colleagues in your small group, or I guess Ashley was referring to them as subcommittees, and um, kind of divvy up some of these tasks and start um, working on them. If there's something that your subcommittee feels is really pertinent to um, your area of focus, you know, please feel free to go ahead. I know people have already been putting forth some really excellent suggestions on different things. Um, but if you could just sort of, um, if, if it's gonna sort of diverge from what it is that we've had here, just shoot me an email. I'm kind of the point person on our tasks and work assignments. Um, but just start um, divvying up these tasks and everybody sort of commit to taking some of it. I don't know how many of us have had to do group projects before and sometimes it's one or two people in the group end up doing 90% of the work. We wanna try to keep this evenly spread Everybody is, you know, um, giving of their time and energy, and we're so appreciative of that. Um, but we want to try to be pretty um, fair about the uh, uh, amount of work that we ask each member of the subcommittee to do. So if you have any questions, any um, suggestions, just shoot me an email. But if you guys could go ahead and, um, you know, either meet or email in your group and kind of divvy up some assignments and get working on those issues, that would be fantastic. Thank you all so much. Is there anything else you needed me to review, Ashley? I don't think so, Ms. Lucas, I think it's great. Um, I just wanted to pause here in case anyone had any questions or comments here. Please feel free. I think you were saying something. <laughs> Ms. Lucas, were you? Did I, cut yeah, you off? I had a quick question. I had mentioned this at a previous meeting about sometimes, uh, just like every field, we have a lot of different acronyms and abbreviations for things. And I've been kind of keeping track of a glossary of some of the ones that I thought might be helpful for people. I know it's terrible when we meet as NOAA because we are constantly using abbreviations and new people will be like, what does that mean? So. If that is helpful to people, I am happy to include that in the information uh, that we put on that SharePoint site, so you just have it to refer to. If it's not important and I'm uh, overestimating the importance of that, please speak up and say so. But if anybody feels like that would be helpful, I'm happy to continue to do that as we go along. I would err on the side of including it, especially since we all have been uh, victims of alphabet soup with uh, acronyms. So I, I would include it myself. Um, and thank you, Ms. Lucas, for keeping a track of that. Um, if there are no more questions here, we'll move forward with the uh, wrap up and uh, forecast for our future me meetings here. I do wanna share the update that um, uh, while Ms. Bilal did have to step away, she did share that she would be more than happy to volunteer to do um, represent the policy committee on um, uh, the new data committee. Uh, so Ms. Cirillo, if you could include her, that would be in, in incredible. Um, and then also, I didn't mention this in the beginning, but I, I don't wanna have any meeting without acknowledging Ms. Gilchrist uh, and our ITS that assist us. Uh, so thank you so very much because we cannot do any of this without um, your indispensable assistance. Um, I also wanna apologize, I've got a bit of uh, my canine babies are losing their minds right now uh, and even though they have a whole house to play they have decided to use this room um, so I apologize for that and we'll, we'll find a clear my partner's not here today so there's no babysitter there's no dog sitter um, we have to your stomach and you're just really hungry what <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I had a quick question I'm sorry I just wanted to make sure Amanda did you say Fallon is going to be in the training group, so there'll be four of us. I just want to make sure we've got to reach out to one another. Yes, Bob has joined the training group. Please include him. Perfect. All right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Delgado. Sounds like you know my pain. So it's not based on the laughter I see on people's face, others know it too. Uh, so I just uh, two more updates here um, so we can close out. So next week we've agreed that we will meet uh, and Mr. Robinson will share more details. We'll meet in person 
uh, with our masks and be safe and dis distanced uh, for the training academy uh, experience. And we'll have more details coming your way. And then um, Ms. Lucas and I, as uh, she will we'll meet tomorrow, Mr. Button and Ms. Cirillo, and we will follow up on the outstanding uh, data requests and also ensure that we can offer a full forecast of testimony to come in the coming weeks. I believe that is all of uh, the updates and uh, points we need to share. Oh, very, very much important here. For awareness, we did share with the mayor or ask that uh, notice be shared with the mayor and vice mayor, as well as uh, Mayor Dean, um, who's the co-chair of the commission, so that they would be welcome to attend next week's um, uh, training experience as well. Um, we said, said it would be the 17th or the 24th, but now that we know the date, we can confirm that. Um, Ms. Lucas, any other details? Ms. Lucas, anything else you would share? No, that's it. You got it. Okay. Uh, anything else from the body here? All right. I promise to feed and put away my dogs next week. I promise you. Um, wonderful to see everyone. Hope you everyone has a safe weekend and, and a good weekend as well. Have a good one, everyone. Take care. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.